So the other day I received a comment on one of my posts on Facebook where I was revisiting an amp model that I had looked at in a previous dialing in video. I've been doing a series like this called Helix Amps Revisited and a lot of people have been enjoying it. And I show kind of a stripped down version of some of my bigger presets that I have up on the Line 6 Marketplace and just take you through step by step how I went about dialing it in and the tools that I use within the Helix to make those sound as good as I feel they can sound. But sometimes I get comments that folks seem a little upset or put out that I'm putting these presets out and I don't really understand why because nobody's forcing anybody to watch it. I do get a lot of people watch it, they appreciate it, they, they grab the free preset, they enjoy it and they tell me such but others seem a little bit annoyed at it. So I, I got this comment which I found really bizarre because first of all uh, it was responding directly to a post I made but didn't really address me personally. It was just more of a, a comment that seemed a little put out at the fact I was putting these videos out. And the comment was this. It says, that person's presets are always the same. Two EQ blocks and one or two compressors. I used this bunch of EQ and compressor when I had a zoom in order to try to improve its timbre, which was rubbish. I don't understand the need for so many EQ and comp on the HX. I found that comment to be a little odd and a little disingenuous. So either this commenter hasn't actually watched my videos and listened to how I approach things or they're being purposely misleading. I, I'm not sure which one, but a couple points just to talk about uh, from this particular comment. The reason I'm actually focusing on it is because I do get comments like this every now and then. I always kind of scratch my head wondering where they're getting their ideas from. So the first point I wanted to talk about was he says one or two compressors. Well, first of all, I oftentimes, as people who follow my channel know I do utilize one compressor always at the end of the chain in a very subtle manner. We're going to review this today. I just want to go and reiterate because I thought comment like this is a good opportunity to actually dive back in and show what I actually do. And some of the tricks that I've used that I've had many, many people tell me have really helped them to get the most out of their Helix. So I do use that one compressor in a very subtle manner. And that's the thing a lot of people miss is they think I'm using this overt compression all the time. And it's so important. I've said it so many times but it seems to go over a lot of people's heads that the way that this is used is very important. It can be very damaging to use compression or it can be one of the best things we could ever possibly use to really give some polish to a preset. I don't want to say I've never used two compressors. There's probably very special situations where I, I have still have my compressor at the end and maybe I'm doing like a clean funk thing and I want a real squashy compressor at the beginning. I guess in that case on some clean tones, maybe on very seldom occasions I've used two, but as a general rule, I don't really recommend that, nor do I use it. Uh, if somebody wants to, obviously that's fine. At the end of the day, as I've always said, if you are getting great results from whatever you're doing, you should just continue doing that and don't have to listen to me or anybody else. But putting this idea forward that I'm always using two compressors is just false and misleading, and I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. So I very seldom do that, but I will show you how I use the one single compressor today. The other comment was how I use two EQ blocks in every preset and that is actually true but the thing about it is just because a block is present in a helix preset doesn't mean it's actually doing anything you could have a block there and not even have any of the settings changed from the default zero position on an eq and therefore it's there but it's not actually affecting the tone so some folks might say, well, why do you have it there? Well, we're going to talk about that when I dive into my template that I use for all my presets and that a lot of folks have used and told me has really helped them. And we'll discuss exactly how I use those EQ blocks. And you'll see that it's not really as overt as a lot of folks might think. Now, this idea that I always use these things, well, yes, I, I work from a template, a template that I have up on Custom Tone that I'll put the link to below. A template is just that. It's a starting point, right? It's going to be a place for us to begin, obviously, depending on the amp we're using and the cab we're using and where we set the microphones and which microphones we use, we're going to have to make adjustments. How hard are we hitting the front of that compressor at the end? Well, we're going to have to adjust the gain reduction so it's not doing too much. Uh, what microphone did I choose? Maybe it's a darker microphone like a Coles 4038 or the Ribbon 4038 that we have in the Helix and I need to brighten that up using a shelf EQ. You know, that's common stuff. That's just the same sort of thing that's done in recording studios when engineers record real guitar amplifiers. They will add EQ and compression after the fact. This is nothing new and it's not something that should shock anybody doesn't mean that there's anything lacking in the Helix or that it needs this. And that's the other point is that he says, I don't understand the need for so many compressors and EQs. Well, again, uh, there isn't so many compressors and EQs. There's one compressor adding a tiny bit of glue and a couple compressors that may or may not even be used. 
So there isn't this need for it. Nobody ever said or implied that there was a need for it. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't take a great existing tone, maybe from just an amp and a cab in the Helix, and gently tweak it to be the best it can be and to fit in wonderfully in a mix for both live or studio situations. I just want to reply to that, not so much specifically to this comment, but to the general comments I get that kind of somehow have this. To be honest, the vast majority of response I get from the videos I do is positive. But I do see this, and this person actually went and copy and pasted this same message across various places because he seemed really bothered by the fact that I, I had released this video or that I released these videos. And again, here's the other thing. If you don't like what I do, nobody's forcing anybody to use it. You can simply not watch the video or you could simply not follow the things that I say that I like to do. It's really that simple and I don't lose any sleep over it. I'm okay with it and we can still be friends. It's perfectly fine. And I don't expect everybody to want to work the same way, but I do get tons of questions from people and they ask me how I do things. So that's why I do the videos. And in the past number of years, literally thousands of people have contacted me and told me that this has helped them immensely. So I'll continue doing it. But again, like I said, it's it's fine. I get it if not everybody likes the way that I work and they don't have to use it. But I am going to go now to Helix Native so that we can talk a little more in depth about these particular things, why I do what I do in the template. And it's always good to kind of refresh this for folks who haven't seen the past videos about. So let's head over to Helix Native and I'm using that today so that we can see the compression gain reduction meters. Otherwise, I just would have used Helix in the HX Edit, but today we're going to use Helix Native for that reason. So let's head over and take a look. All right, so here we are over in Helix Native, and I have my template that I have up on Custom Tone. This is the Mono Helix template, just set up as you would download it. Now, obviously, there's no amp here. I did throw a cab in here simply to show people how I would normally work, and here's a cab. I put a 121 ribbon on the cap edge three inches back. Now, don't think that this is carved in stone in any way. Obviously, depending on the amp we throw in here, we may have to move this microphone around or change the microphone. It really depends on our tastes and what our end goals are. But I just wanted to start you off here. This is a, a mic I use fairly often that I enjoy very much. So we would obviously have to take this template and add an amp to it. But the things that this commenter was referring to was this. You'll notice there isn't two compressors. There's one compressor at the end. And I'm going to show you once we load up an amp model here, just how little gain reduction we actually will get and how we should adjust adjust this to get just a little tiny bit so this isn't going to be destructive in any way it's just going to add a little bit of sweetness to our sound and help glue things together a bit you'll notice the parametric eq i have in so he mentioned two eqs that's right i do have two eqs in there this eq is set to low gain of zero db boost or cut mid gain of zero db boost or cut high gain of zero db boost or cut and a low cut of 100 hertz and high cut of 12 kilohertz so it's doing pretty much nothing. We're doing a little bit of low cut, a little bit of high cut. Now you might say, well, why did you even bother putting it in there? And this is a question I've answered a bunch of times, but it seems to be important to mention it again. I put this in here just in case. Uh, we're not low on processing power in the Helix. This isn't really taking up too much space in the Helix. It's not eating up too much of my processing power. So what if I got to a particular venue where there was a particular frequency that I wanted to boost or cut for whatever reason, maybe the room. And I know a lot of people say, oh, you can use your global EQ. And I'm not a fan of using the global EQ. I like to deal on a per preset basis, but Having said that, folks who do like to use Global EQ should use it, and that's perfectly fine and acceptable, and I'm okay with that. I don't ever want anybody walking away thinking that what I am saying, I'm saying in a way that it must be followed, but this is just how I like to work with it. So I just want to have that ability to have this there, and it's already in the preset. If I do need to dive into you know, a particular frequency with a particular cue and booster cut it, I have it there. I don't have to fiddle, and it, it's just there. But most of the time, I would say in probably 95% of my presets, these don't get touched, but I do use it for low and high cut. Now, if, what if I was using a HX Stomp and I had limited ability to put blocks in and limited processing power? Well, I would go to my cab block and apply my low and high cuts in there, uh, keeping in mind they're not as dramatic as the low and high cuts from the parametric EQ, so you might have to be a little more aggressive with it. But again, we can tune that in by ear. But that's why that EQ exists. The fact that it's there, though, doesn't mean it's doing a lot in this idea that, oh, the Helix needs to have these all these EQs is just false. It's not what I'm claiming, and it's not what I'm doing with it. Now, coming over to the other EQ, though, I do have a low and high shelf that I oftentimes have set here at the low frequency of 650 hertz, the high frequency of 650 hertz, minus 2 dB on all the frequencies below 650 and plus 2 dB on all the frequencies above. Now, there's very good reason for this. Through a lot of experimentation, a lot of experience in the studio and with the Helix, 
I find that that particular setting is a real sweet spot. Now, others may disagree, and that's okay. Others may not like it, and that's okay. The setting of 650 hertz kind of takes in the low gain and, and cleans up the bottom end when we cut that. And it kind of takes out some of those muddy frequencies in the low mids around 400, 450 hertz that sometimes need to be controlled just to kind of allow the tone to sit nicer and not be quite as muffled maybe sounding or wooly sounding or muddy sounding, especially the fact that I like to use ribbon mics. That's an important setting. So I found 650 hertz here and cutting that by even 1 dB, maybe 2 dB. If it's a really problematic tone, then maybe 3 3 or 4 dB, but seldom do I go down there. And then all the frequencies above that, when you get up into the 8, 900 hertz range, there's a certain something I like to add to a guitar tone that I find is really nice. And then some of those upper mids and into the highs, the boosting, it just adds a little bit of sparkle and fullness to the sound and helps it to cut in the mix as well. So these I find are great starting settings. Now, the other thing is a lot of folks might say, well, yeah, but you can accomplish the same thing by moving the microphone around, you know, and this is absolutely true. But I'll tell you, in my experience in talking to folks, a lot of folks don't have experience moving microphones around and knowing that, you know, if you move it more to the center of the cone, you're going to get a little more harsh frequencies. If you move it out here, it's going to warm up and get darker. So to explain that is kind of difficult sometimes for somebody who just wants Wants to make a quick tweak. So I've found the high and low shelf is a great way for folks who maybe aren't comfortable playing with other parameters such as mics and mic placement to really be able to quickly tweak their tone. And I love to have this in all my presets. If I get to a venue and I find, wow, things are sounding a little bit bright today, I can just roll this high gain back by a dB, dB and a half. And it usually fixes things. If I find things are a little too muddy, I can roll this back. Or maybe, you know, I want to have a little more fullness to it. I can roll this up. But I found that this is a starting point. But keep in mind, these are starting points. The fact that I've added this into all of my presets gives the end user the ability to really quickly tweak things in a very intuitive manner to their tastes, their monitoring system, and their guitar, or the room they're playing in, and any other reason why they would want to tweak these. So that's why I have it, but you'll notice here this idea that, oh, the Helix needs this is just ridiculous. Nobody has said that, and I'm not implying that either, but can some well-placed EQ, very subtly used, help to maybe polish a preset and make it sound really, really great? Of course it can, and that's why I do these things. So you can see, those are the three main components that most people will criticize, saying, oh, all you, all you do is use a bunch of EQ. And no, I, I don't, I really don't. This is the way most of my presets start, and I tweak from there very subtly and very small moves that can go a long way. Now, obviously, I also have my dynamic ambience, just because direct recorded guitar are always going to be very dry sounding. So I add a little bit of this dynamic ambience in. Beautiful. Just does what it's supposed to do. And I always have a little transistor tape delay there in case I want to kick it in. You'll notice it's bypassed by default. So basically we have this little LA Studio comp. And again, we don't know how this is going to be set until we add an amp. So let, let's just do this. Let's just take this. This is a 412 Greenback 25 with these settings, all the settings as default. And we're going to just come in here and plop an amp in here. So let's do an amp that maybe we wouldn't normally pair with a green bag. Let's, let's go to the Tweed Blues Bright. How's that? Default settings. This is how it comes up. I'm not going to touch anything. Let's play it into my template here and see how it sounds. I'm playing my Gibson SG. <laughs> A listen to if I just turned everything off and had just the amp in the cab. Obviously very dry, but also hear that kind of muddy wooliness to the sound. A lot of folks might say, well, that's because you're using a 121 ribbon. And that's true, but there's something I love about the ribbon mics. I could just go put a 57 on there. Now there's something I don't like about it anymore. I don't like what it's done to those upper mids and highs. So I come back to this. 
Now, if you go follow a company like Royer Labs, they'll actually recommend using a ribbon mic and applying EQ after the fact. This is not something new. This has been done in studios for years, decades, because the ribbon mic gives a beautiful warmth caps, a very natural sound, and it takes EQ beautifully. And that's why I come in after the fact, place this to where I think it's great. <laughs> but maybe could use a little bit of work and then I apply some gentle EQ after the fact and it usually fixes everything. So let's bring in, first of all, let's bring in our dynamic ambience just so we're not dealing with such a bone dry tone. Especially if we switch to the neck pickup on this. Kind of tubby and wooly sounding. So let's do this. Let's bring in that high and low shelf now. I think it's a million times better already with that subtle little fix. Now, was it needed? No. Does it help? Yes. But that's no different than if I had recorded let's say a Fender basement here in the studio, I would likely move that mic around to get my sweet spot using a ribbon mic and then maybe add some gentle EQ after the fact and have it sit beautifully in the mix. So nothing out of the ordinary and a very simple thing to add in. So that's why I use that. And also gives me the ability or the end user the ability to tweak this very quickly for a particular situation. Maybe we want a little more cut on that. We come in here and we say, I'm gonna boost that up to three dB. can see how we can massage this tone very gently, very subtly. You see, it gives us a very fast way of sweetening the tone. Now, we haven't even brought in our low and high cuts here. And again, keep in mind, I engage this, but this is not being used as a parametric EQ. It's there in case we need anything from it. But 90% of the time, I don't even use it. I just use it for my low and high cuts. Just controls that bottom end a little bit so that it's not gonna get in the way of kick drums and bass guitars in a mix. Finally, let's bring in that compressor. Now, you'll notice here, we're gonna try to see what the gain reduction can do. Maybe we'll adjust it so we get it right up until maybe a dB, a dB and a half of gain reduction, maybe between here and the first mark here where it's at minus three. Turn that on. Obviously not even really kicked in. Not even really compressing there. Now, a couple things you gotta be careful of. One way I could get it to compress more is by simply turning up the volume of my amp so that it's hitting the front of that compressor harder. You'll notice by doing that now, I'm getting about three dB of gain reduction too much. So let's back this off. Now I'm getting about the amount of gain reduction we want. Now, if you want a little less than that, you can also come in here and just use the peak reduction. Bring that back to five. Now we're getting about one dB of gain reduction. Now, the other thing is if I turn that off, you'll notice I get a little volume drop. That's because it's not really set at unity gain. Now, if this is an always on sort of thing for you, which it is for me, sometimes I don't even worry about that because I'm just gonna leave that on. But if you're planning on turning it on and off, you would probably want to adjust that. So if we're a little loud, we can come to our final output level, which isn't gonna affect our tone at all. And balance the two. So here it is without that compressor. is with it. 
I would probably just go back up here so it's a little more. <laughs> You should hear just a very subtle kind of glue squish to it. You'll feel it in your playing. And again, this idea that it shouldn't be after the delay or the reverb, I put it there very much on purpose. I'm not using an overt reverb. I'm not using an overt amount of compression. So it's not really going to go damage anything in the delay or the reverb. And watch, I'll put the delay on here now. It's having very subtle, if any, effect on those delayed repeats. But what we have now is an extremely polished, usable tone, and we did not even come in here and touch the tone stack. A lot of folks say, oh, I would come in and mess around with the tone stack, and you, you should, you know, you should absolutely do that. I would do that first. Get the amp acting in the way that you want, and use this following section as a sweetener, right, to just polish that tone. And so, so the first step would be get your microphone positioned and chosen correctly, or for what you need, get your mic position and distance where you want it to get roughly the tone you're looking for, adjust your tone stack to where you want in your amp settings, then come into this section and use it, as I said, as a sweetener to polish that sound and get it exactly the way that you want. And I think you're going to find that it's going to be a very nice way to work. So if I turn all of that off again, here's what we started with. <laughs> Extremely subtle, bring our low and high cut. Dynamic ambience. And low and high shelf. And if we so desire, a little bit of delay. So there you have it. I feel kind of a necessary review of my thoughts on this. That's it in a nutshell. That's how I work. That's how I get my tones. Now there's obviously more to it. You have to have a good monitoring system to, to know what decisions to make with those sweeteners. And you have to have a set of ears to know what you're listening for. But that's a great starting point. I, I think that it can help a lot of folks to get more out of their presets, whether they're creating them, or even if you're using one of my presets, you can go in and gently tweak it. There's no such thing as a perfect preset for everybody. It depends on the guitar we use. It depends on the monitoring system we're using, the room we're in, our tastes, what our end goals are, the particular situation we're in. So taking all of those things into account, if you have a great starting point and you know the proper way to go in and have the right tools in place to make very quick tweaks, it can go a long way to coming up with a successful result in a much quicker, easier fashion and keep your workflow in a manner that's going to allow you to concentrate more on your playing, which is what this is really all about. So today I want to leave you with the sound of my Tweed Blues Bright Ultimate preset from the Line 6 Marketplace, which is going to use a similar setup. Obviously my Marketplace presets that I have available are much more in depth, multiple snapshots. There's gonna be multiple effects. They're gonna be dialed in just perfectly as a wonderful starting point for just about every situation that you can tweak from there using the things I talked about today. So I'd like to let you hear how utilizing some of these techniques in a much more complex preset can sound. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Please like the video, please share it with anybody you think would get some use or enjoyment out of watching it. And also please subscribe to the channel, hit the little bell notification to get notified when I put new content out. Thank you guys again so much for tuning in and I'll leave you with my Tweed Blues Bright Ultimate preset from the Line 6 Marketplace, and the link is below if you enjoy what you heard. Thanks again for sharing your time with me. I'll be back really soon. Ciao for now.